Hello my friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. So guys, Paracas, Peru. Paracas, Peru. Paracas is a town on Peru's west coast. It's known for its beaches, like El Chaco, set on sheltered Paracas Bay. And a beautiful place. And home to these interesting skulls. So these are the Paracas skulls. And these are most definitely some unique finds that we have found in Paracas, Peru. In 1928, archaeologist Julio Tello discovered more than 300 odd skeletal remains in a complex grave system on the desert peninsula of Paracas on the southern coast of Peru. These skulls were unusually elongated. These became known as the Paracas skulls. The Paracas History Museum, in conjunction with the Peruvian government, recently conducted DNA tests on these Paracas skulls. The scientists have now concluded that these skeletons are from another human subspecies that first emerged from the area of the Ca Caucasus Mountains between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, where other similar skulls have been found about 3,000 years ago. That is pretty dang interesting if you ask me. These are not Homo sapiens sapiens, my friends. These are not you and I. Well, perhaps not all of us anyway. So, wow. Who are these beings? Who are they? I know many of you out there are already shouting some words. I hear somebody shouting Nephilim. Perhaps. Perhaps that's exactly who they are. We'll take a look deeper into this. The museum's director, Brian Forrester, has accepted that they are human in origin and they somehow migrated to Peru. Now, they're not, they're, as, we, as I said before, perhaps they're going back to that and it's pretty fascinating. So these are structurally different and they have, some, have only one parietal plate as opposed to the two normally found in human skulls. You could say in some ways they were a mix or a hybrid of different people. Or perhaps we are the hybrid and they are closer to the original? Interesting. But it's certain that the skull's elongation is due to genetics and not by intentional cranial deformation which they have sold us throughout you know, almost a hundred years now. They said that, well, you know, some some tribes found that it was beautiful, so they intentionally put wood and bound it around the young infant and then child in order to create what they perceived as beauty. But you know what? That wasn't the case. That was trying to sell us a bill of goods. The cranial volume of the Homo sapiens sapiens paracas is 25% larger and 60% heavier than that of a conventional human skull. These are not typical humans. There is something different here. So it's pretty, it's pretty fascinating, you know, and when you look at it, our history is not what we've been sold. Not at all. Not at all. I mean, any of you guys that have looked into mud flood, um, you know, that will definitely put big question marks into your head for sure, as well as so many other things. So, as this here states, nothing in the given evidence contradicts the theory that they could be the remnants of an Anunnaki species that was stranded on Earth after the pole shift 12,000 BC that shifted Atlantis to the South Pole to become Antarctica. This makes more sense than a wildly deformed human subspecies that migrated 15,000 miles from the Caucasus eastward to Peru at the beginning of the Iron Age. Yeah, so let's look at this again. Here we are, Paracas. And if we're looking at like the Crimea and the Black Sea and, you know, really? How did they get there? How did they get there 3,000 years ago, right? So why are we celebrating Columbus? I mean, in the first place, you know, even if you want to celebrate Columbus as the first European, quote unquote, 
to step foot in the Americas, even that's wrong. I mean, it's all wrong. All of our history is totally bunk. They have hidden things from us on purpose. And, you know, we're uncovering these things. We know it. And so these are just more evidence to the fact that everything has been co covered up and hidden on purpose. And really, when you look at this, this is good evidence to fit that fits in perfectly with the whole Anunnaki thesis, especially when you start looking at the uh, stories of the Anunnaki and, and start looking at all those translations. It's, it, it really does seem to fit well. And of course, you know, the mainstream, they don't want this coming out. They definitely don't want this coming out. Now, it definitely doesn't even mean that these Anunnaki, you know, as we touched on before, perhaps there's the possibility that these are people that have held on to their advanced knowledge, advanced culture, and perhaps, you know, we don't really even know how many different types of humanoids have been on this planet. There have been countless giant skeletons that have been unearthed and then dumped in the ocean by the Smithsonian. And there are photos, old time photos from, you know, the 1800s, uh, you know, 1880s, I, I remember seeing some, you know, where they've dug up giant bodies and taken photos next to them. And, uh, you know, of course, all these giants go missing. But you can't cover this up forever. And now we're starting to see the bigger picture. So it's fascinating, too, about the blood types. For instance, most Native Americans are blood type O. That's the most predominant type. Over 25% of these are AB negative. AB negative is so rare. AB negative is 0.6% of the population. 0.6. It's, it's not even 1%. It's just over half of a percent. It's very rare. And yet this is what over 25% of these are. Pretty interesting, you know, to say the least. This is very interesting. You know, you should be seeing type O, but it's not the case. There's other types in there as well, but the fact that AB negative is, is 25%? Wow. What's up with that? <laughs> you know, and you have type A. It, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And this is a huge cover-up. And again, as we've shown... And we've talked about just in the recent videos too when you look at these heads these people were in positions of power you know we've seen this with uh akhenaten right akhenaten and nefertiti let's elongated skulls here are your rulers kingship was given from on high on high on high guys from above kingship was given from above and their ancestors were the first kings they were worshipped as gods. Well, it kind of all makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, it's pretty simple. It really is pretty simple. Cranial deformation. Yeah, sure. We buy it. Interesting, too. The snake's coming out of their pineal gland. Anyway, yeah. It all is making sense. And this is Brian Forrester. And uh, this is out of Ancient Origins. And so, also, I want to share with you guys this video. So this is a video in which he goes over these DNA results. And I uh, heartily encourage you guys to go ahead and check it out. And uh, 
I subscribe to them, keep up on this as well. Very interesting stuff. You know, there's other people talking about this as well. And this is how the Sasquatch Chronicles blog. And again, you know, the chances of uh, the blood type, the chances of the head, you know, they, they came out of the Caucasus area. All fascinating stuff that points, well, you know, it points to the fact that a lot of these legends are real. And they've just been covering this up. And these are the people, as we were talking about Queen Nefertiti, you know, these are the rulers. And also, the religious rulers. <laughs> yeah, you know, so they control us. And they've given us. They've given us our culture. They've given us pretty much all that we know. And so, you know, this is just more evidence to it. And it really goes in so well with the stories of the Anunnaki's. And here we have strange elongated skulls again found. And uh, these, this one right here reveals that medieval Bulgarian brides were traded for politics. And one of the other interesting features, too, is that there was a lot of them with red hair. And so that's another genetic characteristic that goes along with it. And so the Anunnaki Aztec connection, you know, and when we read the books all about the Sumerians and their gods, the Anunnaki, we discover, you know, there was factionalism in there. There was kind of like this more than just animosity between Enki and Enlil, his brother, more than just animosity going on. You know, there was rivals going on and factionalism. They tended to be very warlike and they tended to always fight amongst each other. Each one, you know, kind of vying for superiority uh, while you know, doing their best to make it look like they're following orders. And uh, it's it's all pretty interesting, but these these stories talk about them going to the New World and, um, you know, coming to the New World. And there is most definitely a connection to, to the New World, both in Mexico and in Peru. And um, what you're looking at is this Franciscan friar, Bernardino de Sahogun, one of the most important chroniclers of the Aztec conquest and arrived in Mexico a few years after the Cortez epic and he spoke the local tongue and he devoted more than 30 years to the study of the indigenous traditions and one of the fascinating things that comes out is the main Aztec god Quetzalcoatl represented sometimes as a feathered serpent or as a man with a beard in a white tunic there you go again. And it's the same thing as, as what we see over in and with the Sumerians and with the Anunnaki. He was worshipped as the one who taught them writing, star observation, and even more important, the one who left them their mysterious calendar. And also, again, this harkens to the book of Enoch, you know, with the watchers, you know, teaching man all their ways. And for the Aztecs, Quasicotl really lived among them in the past. He was right there. He really was there. This tradition was so rooted amongst the natives that some Spanish chroniclers identified him as the Apostle St. Thomas. And so they give interesting details on Quasicotl's legacy. And so he noticed that the Aztec children of noble birth were handed over to a school called Kalmakak. Which, of which Quetzalcoatl was the patron. There, all the students learned about astronomy and dream interpretation and were also taught how to count days and years. In short, they learned to measure time as Quetzalcoatl had taught their ancestors. So how important was this legacy and what does it have to do with the Anunnaki? The Aztec calendar, which is not a mere time measurement instrument, divides human history into five eras. The end of the first era was, era, era was caused by a deluge. The next three eras ended in catastrophe. Finally, the Aztecs appeared in the fifth era, 
and according to the chronology of the Aztec calendar, the Great Flood occurred around 11,000 BC. Surprisingly, this is the same time frame determined by scientific researchers for this event, and that doesn't agree basically again with Douglas Vogt uh, of Diehold, and uh, fascinating because he's the one that came up with the solar flash, or at least he's the one that I heard talk about the solar flash first, and uh, how it's going to lead to you know, basically a complete polar reversal, massive tidal waves, and the like. And so how could the Aztecs back then, more than 3,000 years ago, know about the dates of the Great Flood? If their calendar indeed marks precisely the age in which the Great Flood happened, why shouldn't we believe there are other claims? And then we get into Sitchin, and uh, Sitchin tells us, according to this calendar, there were white-haired giants in the first or second eras, in the third era, there were the red-haired uh, giants as well, and then Quasicodal appeared in the fourth era wearing a white tunic and a beard. And so obviously human history is way more complicated than we think. And so, you know, there is the thought that he is Ningashida as well. And um, Ningashida is the son of Enki, whom the Sumerians immoral immortalized in their tablets as the Sumerian god of knowledge, also thought to be Thoth uh, with the Egyptians as well, Mercury's, Mercury and Hermes, all the same individuals. And so, you know, it's fascinating how these things all tied together. And uh, it just, it makes sense. One of the other interesting things that it touches on here is you know, a detail that backs this whole theory is the fact that the Olmecs, one of the oldest cultures in the region, had a population with purely African features. The Olmec statues are an evident sign of this connection, and there are many studies that confirm African presence in America long before the arrival of the Spaniards. And one of these studies is that by the Mexican historian Vicente Riva Palacio, who wrote back in 1870 that it's indisputable that in very old times the black race populated our territory. These Olmecs with African features would be the ones who came with the Anunnaki Ningashida from the Middle East and Africa, or in any case his descendants. The similarity among the Aztec pyramids, the Egyptian pyramids, and the much older Sumerian ziggurats is so evident that it's not necessary to make a detailed analysis. How can we explain all that we've previously seen without there being a previous contact between the Sumerian and Aztec civilizations hundreds of years before the arrival of the Span Spaniards? We can doubt Sitchin's explanations, we can disagree with him, but we can't deny that there's enough evidence to, sus to has sustain his hypothesis, or at to at the very least consider that the history we know is not the only one and not the real one and it all does go together very very well when you look at it and uh, this gets into Ningashida a little bit more and you know who he is and I've always thought too that perhaps Nibiru is not really a planet perhaps it's just a mothership you know the Death Star or what what have you there's there's so much evidence to this and and you know why do we see the disparity in size between the Anunnaki and humans? Is it real? Is it really real? And so it's it's all very interesting, very very interesting. And you got to say that the more you look at the evidence, the more it looks very likely. Well, it it looks like it's a real possibility. Lake Titicaca and the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki are considered by many as the founding fathers of civilization and mankind. The cradle of civilization is considered to be in Sumer. Some archaeologists even suggest the Anunnaki have a very important history with South America and the pre-Inca and the Inca civilization. Modern day archaeology does not agree with these theories, even though there's plenty of evidence. Newly found discoveries such as a pyramid that's been located buried underneath Tiwanaku provide new theories regarding this ancient culture. And so, what is the real truth here? What is the real truth? And I'll just share with you, I have a, a good friend uh, from Peru, and he has shared with me that, you know, in this area, 
they still to this day see all sorts of UFOs, all sorts, all sorts of orbs of light uh, disappearing, coming to and fro from certain areas. They still believe that they're there. And this is going on Puma Punku from AncientAliens.com, and uh, we, we there's just so much evidence. There's so much evidence. The timelines all work. There's so much evidence about this. It just kind of fits. And then when we see this, who are the ant people of the Hopi? Remember the ant people of the Hopi led them down into the earth in order to escape one of the, you know, one of the great cataclysms and then let them know when it was time to come back up, when it was time to come back up and safe because they had to go into the earth to survive this one particular cataclysm and we might have to do that again um, but what did they call them they called them the Anu Naki and here we have the Hopi people American Southwest agreeing with these people and saying that the same beings that were over here and we might say over here as well and perhaps they were down here as there are gold mines down through here all through South Africa up to, through Zimbabwe and over into this area here that date to such old age some have said as much as hundreds of thousands of years ago so it obviously wasn't our quote-unquote ancestors if we're going to believe the modern theory that had made gold mines for the purpose of extracting gold okay so my friends what are your thoughts on this how do we put all this together what do you think what are your thoughts is it real is it true do the Anunnaki really exist? Are they on their way back? Are they here now? Are they cloaked in the sky above us right now? Have their ancestors been ruling us as kings, queens, and even popes? Have they brought us all of our culture and even our warlike tendencies? As always, my friends, like, share, subscribe. I really look forward to your thoughts and your opinions on this. God bless. Namaste.